Got some good news and bad news. Good news is my message is really short. <laughs> bad news, my introduction is really long. <laughs> I'm going to ask permission for five more minutes than I usually take. So if I got that, you're, you're usually, well, not half of you owe me five minutes because you come ten minutes late. So <laughs> somebody asked me this week, Pastor Greg, do you still support President Trump? And I say, absolutely, 100%. I support this man. I support him. I'm under, I under, I'm under no illusions. He's not the Messiah. And God knows he's not perfect. There's a lot of things I would fix on that guy. I don't know if that called a suntan or whatever it is, but I'd fix some things. But there's been no other president in our history that has protected religious freedoms more than Donald Trump has. So I don't know what happens Wednesday, but if he's not our president on Wednesday, then I am sad. Some of you may not agree. That's fine. Maybe online you don't agree. That's fine. Let's just have a conversation in four years from now. And we'll talk about freedoms, okay? We'll talk about freedoms. Because i got to frame this moment that we're in right now. i got to frame it. For you to understand why I preach the way I do, you have to understand the framework. This is not COVID. COVID was a setup for the next step. And that is to take away your religious and your personal freedoms. That's where we're at right now. That's the, that's the moment that we're in. People ask, when are you going to get off this thing, Greg? Um, what's important to you? What, what is important to you? I, is your freedom, your faith, your conviction, your future, if it is important to you, then I'm going to stay on this thing. You know, I'm perceived, I am perceived. I, I, I am perceived as a radical, which is just hysterical to me. I am the most predictable person there is on the planet. And so, you know, um, if I don't preach this, who will? Who will? I just, who will? It, 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 if we don't keep these issues of culture right out in front, we're going to lose this whole thing. And you think that this is a four-year game, and next year, in four years, we'll get another chance. Do you not understand what is being played out with you right now? This is not about a four-year game. This is about the United States of America and transforming it into something you never have seen before. That's what this game is about. This is a critical week. It's a critical week that we enter into as a nation. Um, I want to talk to you about the consolidation of power. Acts chapter 2 verse 1 says this. When the day, when the day of Pentecost came. Now watch the next seven words. They were all together in one place. Somebody say Transformation. Uh, you didn't come to hear what I think. You came to hear what the Spirit of God is saying in this moment. You came to hear a word of God. You came to hear from the throne of God. You came to hear what, what is the heart of God. You came to hear the inspired word of God declared. So we in this moment say, uh, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit of God is saying to the church, what the Spirit of God is saying to destiny. And I can tell you, I know for sure what the Spirit of God is saying to this church. And it's saying this, position yourself. Position yourself. We are in a moment of positioning, and the church must get its right foothold in this moment if we do not position ourselves correctly, and we position ourselves to be politically neutral. That neutrality will castrate and cause the church to be impotent, and the church will have no power. We're also in a moment of declaration. We declare where we stand in this moment right now. 
We, we, this is a moment of, uh, uh, we separate ourselves. This is a moment of consecration uh, for the battles that are in front of us. See, you cannot win a war if you don't engage in the battle. And the battle's in front of us, and we must engage. See, the only hope for this world, the only hope for the United States of America is for the church to position itself, for the church to align itself, for the church to walk in dominion as God created the church to be, so the church can be the gateway of heaven that manifests itself on this earth. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The church is the hope of the world because it is only the church that has been commissioned to be the messenger of the good news of Jesus Christ. Listen. Listen, Destiny. Jesus is the answer. Jesus, he is not a part of the answer. He is the answer. And we are not going to present Jesus as some milk toast, weak need religious figure that has said some good things that makes you feel good about yourself on the inside. We are going to present Jesus as the Savior of the world. We need a Savior right now. And we are going to present Jesus as the only answer that this world needs. We need need a savior we will not hide Jesus we will not politicize Jesus we will not be ashamed of Jesus and we will not compromise Jesus we will preach Jesus we will preach his life his death his resurrection according to the scripture that's our call as a church we've been commissioned with the good news of Jesus Christ somebody shout amen, amen. in this moment God is calling a remnant church not a majority church not a well-liked church, but a remnant church that will not shrink back, that will not cave to pressure. The remnant church, what does it look like? It looks like the Book of Acts church. It is a transformed church. It is a spirit-inspired church. It is a bold church. It is a healing church. It is a gospel-spreading church. Church, but you got to understand the moment that we're in right now, destiny. We are in the end times. And if you know the word of God, we went through a study. You should know that in the last days that you are a part of a persecuted church. My friend, Pastor Mike McClure from San Jose is being fined $1.5 million for having church for having church, and the DA said this week, as they presented their case in Superior Court in Santa Clara, fines might not be enough, which is the threat of locking our pastor up. My friends, we are a persecuted church. When our friend, Sh Senator Shannon uh, Groves, who has found out this week that fellow Republicans want to remove her from her uh, seat as the leader of the Republican Party in the state of California. And even one of them said that she ought to be arrested for following and supporting Donald Trump. I'm telling you, right now, we are in a critical moment. In the last days, there will be perilous times. We are living in the last days, and we are a persecuted church. It used to be Republicans versus Democrats, red versus blue. We used to think in terms of conservatism versus being liberal. But let me pull the curtain back and tell you the global diabolical strategy that is in the air right now. When Barack Obama said, we are fundamentally transforming the United States of America. He was prophesying into our future right now. We need to understand there is a global agenda by global elitists that plays right into the hands of the spirit of the Antichrist. I'm just preaching the word of God. If you know the word of God, that's what the end times looks like. And the global ag agenda is a total annihilation of the United States. And you know why? It's because Satan opposes anything God has ordained. And God ordained the United States of America to be the ambassador of the gospel of Jesus Christ to the entire world. That was the That's why we were ordained as a nation. Read 
Read our founding documents. Go to our class on defending your freedoms. Our founding fathers, not perfect, nor neither are you. They acknowledge it was God who sovereignly brought the creation of this nation. So Satan opposes any nation that would be willing to say, in God we trust. And I am praying again that there would be a revival that would shake America. And we would be proud again to say, in God we trust in the United States of America. The global agenda is a world without borders. You better listen to me. It is a world without this book. It is a world without a pastor behind a, a pulpit preaching the uncompromised word of God. The global agenda is a world that you are subservient to the powerful and the elite. The global agenda is to take away your inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The global agenda isn't Democrat versus Republican, blue versus red. No, the global agenda is totalitarianism. That is a new world order. See, they see that our society needs to be redeemed, and they think they are the redeemer of our society. But I want to let you know, all you liberals out there, my redeemer lives. My redeemer is Jesus Christ. I know who I have put my trust in. My redeemer lives. I wish there was a place to run and hide. I wish there was a Shangri-La. I wish there was an island to buy. I wish there was a permanent red state. There isn't. It doesn't stop at California's borders. That is not the goal and the spirit of the Antichrist. So you gotta move from what you see in the natural. You gotta have supernatural eyes. The church must position itself because this is not a moment, it is the moment. And my fear, the church will become complacent right now. COVID's at rest. We got a new president, God forbid. I, I don't speak that. That's right. Have mercy, God. The church becomes compliant, not wanting to make waves, not wanting to face persecution, not wanting to make hard decisions, not wanting to alienate people groups. So we become like the church in Germany in World War II. We are content to stay inside our churches and sing hymns and preach good sermons as we listen to trains filled with people being shipped to death camps. So we just now sing louder and we make more noise to drown out the death cries that is happening right now in our, our nation. It's happening even in this moment. And if you're looking for the church to get back to normal, you're looking for the wrong church. I'm not losing hope. I am not losing hope. I do not have it within me. I do not have it within me to roll over and play dead like I am just going to be a good old soldier. You can tell me what to do. I don't have it within me to do that. And if they have to lock me up, they have to lock me up. I'm not, I'm not going to roll over. It's not what I read in the book of Acts. They were locked up and beaten. I read about, though, in the book of Acts, a church that is being transformed by the presence and power of God. I read about a church that refuses to be politically correct, to fall in line. I read about a church that counts it all joy to participate in the sufferings of Christ. I read about a church that wasn't a subculture. It was a counterculture. I read about a church in a world that had absolute chaos, was being transformed by the presence of God so that they could transform the culture that they were in. I read in Acts chapter 17, it says this, these 
who have turned the world upside down has come here to dear God let us have that anointing in this moment right now let us have the anointing that we have came to this city we came to this community we have come to this region and this state and this nation and we're going to turn it upside down because the power of God is on us again do it again God if God can do it there, he can do it now. If God can do it then, he can do it now. I want you to hear what the Spirit of God has been saying to me. It's been saying the transformed church is a church that knows how to consolidate power. What does the word consolidate mean? It means to make something stronger. To reinforce and strengthen one's position or power. To combine a number of things into a single more effective whole. Oh, dear God, let that anointing fall on this place right here. I can give you dozens of scriptures. And let me just give you a couple. A consolidated church becomes a power center, and Lord knows we need power. We don't need weak churches. We need strong churches. We need bold pastors, not cowardice pastors. We need a strong church right now. And Jesus said in Acts chapter 1, verse 7, but you shall receive power. Everybody shout power. Power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. This is the only place, the only place that Jesus said that you will receive power it is from the Holy Spirit. That's why Jesus said in John chapter 14, most assuredly I say unto you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will also and greater works than these will he do because I go to the Father. And then when he said, I will send you another and he spoke of the Holy Spirit. A transformed church is a church that operates under the anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit. Without Without that divine power, we'll never be able to out-scheme, out-strategize, out-think, out-cheat our adversary. The book of Acts was a prevailing church. It was a thriving church because the Spirit of God was on that church. And that's our need right now. We need churches where the Spirit of God is residing and empowering people and transforming that church. Now watch the power of consolidation. Deuteronomy chapter 32 says, How could one chase a thousand and two put ten thousand to flight? Often God authors a moment that God gives a grace. He doesn't give an idea. He gives a grace. And that grace is that we come together, that we pull together, that we consolidate our power and we become a, co a cohesive whole together as a church. All the parts, many different backgrounds, all different experiences, all coming together in one place. Hello, Destiny, I'm talking about this place right now. And it's a grace moment that God knits us together so that we can emerge a cohesive of whole with the power of God on us and residing in us. I believe that we're coming into a moment if the church will learn to consolidate our power, we're going to push the enemy up and out of this region. Oh, you don't believe? You don't believe right now? I, I got to have some believers in this place. <laughs> that we are not going to be a state or a nation that is forgotten. God, don't let us be forgotten. That we are going to be a people who are on fire for God. Who believes with me what I'm preaching right now? Is there any believers in the house right now? God, grace gives us a grace moment of supernatural power. It's only by grace that we receive his power. And in this moment, according to Deuteronomy 32... Our addition turns into multiplication. One put a thousand. If you were just doing math, two would put two thousand. But something happens when the church consolidates its power. A touched by God church, an anointed 
uh, uh, church uh, with the power of the Holy Spirit. Two doesn't equal 2,000. Two equals 10,000. But it starts with people of mutual faith consolidating their power and the power starts moving. I believe that we are at a tipping point right now as a people, as a church, as a nation. And right now gravity is working against the church. Political con- correctness is working against the church. Perversion in our culture is working against the church. Council culture is working against the church and and we're at a tipping point and if we do not push back all together the wicked ungodly culture is going to roll right over the church in the United States of America but I'm here to tell you by the spirit of God because the spirit of God said to me there are more for us than those who are against us did you hear what I said there are more for us than those who are against us there are a bunch of people there are a bunch of churches who haven't bowed their knee to Baal. You all have been in the game tug of war, right? You've all experienced that. And when the momentum starts moving one direction, it's almost impossible to stop. But it can if one person will anchor themselves. Oh, did you hear what I just said? One person will just anchor themselves. If they will just position themselves, if they will just dig in and refuse to be moved, and all of a sudden there is a a consolidation of power, and they stop the surge going one direction, and now the momentum begins to shift, and and, and now the things start to move in a different direction, and I believe if we will position ourselves, if we will dig in church in this moment right now, choose you this day whom you will serve. You've got to position yourself. Uh, we'll begin to see things move in a new direction. Don't believe me? Read Acts chapter 2. 120 in the upper room positioned themselves. And God bestowed power on 120. There was a, con- uh, a, a consolidation of power and things began to shift and 120 became 3,000. Now the tipping point has reversed directions. Momentum is starting to shift. Now, instead of gravity working against them, it's working for them. You know what God showed me? He showed me with all these Trump rallies. Oh, oh I know, I said Trump, I'm sorry. Oh, God forbid. I'm, I'm inciting something, you know. Uh-huh. Inciting, I'm inciting all the deplorables at these rallies. Deplorable people, yeah. I'm sorry. Unfiltered. Take it back. Erase it from the tape. God showed me that there are literally, literally millions of people who are ready to shift the gravitational pull in a different direction. I believe, I believe this is what the Spirit of God said to me, that 30 to 40 million people in the United States, if they would be introduced to Jesus in this moment and the power of the Holy Spirit in their life. This is the low-hanging fruit of the revival of the, the harvest that is coming. This, the, this revival, this harvest is going to be easier than you're saying. There would be a consolidation of power that would shake the gravitational plates of the United States of America. And within a few moments, we would see a reversal of trends and the gravity and the, all the things that are evil and wicked and all of a sudden there become righteousness in the land again. All of a sudden there becomes morality in the land again. All of a sudden there becomes a, a, a sense of holiness in the people of God again. And it begins to shift and there is an awakening in churches and the revival that we've been praying for begins to manifest itself and the power of God falls on 40 million people in our nation and there would be a consolidation of power that would change the United States in a heartbeat. The harvest that is coming is a harvest that's going to produce a new army. The army of God that has consolidated their power together and will not be moved. Will not be moved. So all you liberal elites, all you haters... Better get used to half of America saying, we're not backing down. We are not going away. And better yet, we're going to take back what belongs to God. And so I have clarity out there. Not by force. Not by might. Not by strength. 
but by the Spirit of God. When the Spirit of God falls on the United States of America, nothing is gonna stop the move of God. That's my introduction. <laughs> Here's my sermon, which is five minutes. Five minutes. Five minute sermon. Five minute sermon. Here we go. Back to Acts chapter 2, verse 1. When the day, when the day, that's where we're at right now. When the day, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Just look at the words all together. All together. The enemy, Satan, is counting on our division. The devil is counting on the people of God to divide in this moment, but God is doing something that Satan never expected him to do because the church is in a revival of separation. The church is being separated so that we can consolidate. You see what I'm saying? There is a remnant church that is going to come together, and there's going to be a renewed holiness movement. There's going to be a renewed boldness that comes upon that church. It's a moment of separation, so the church won't be divided. Actually, it will be more unified than ever before. Because when I stand up and I say things that I say, when I stand up and I come against groups like, you know, evangelicals for Biden, when I say stuff like that, when I preach the word of God without compromise, when I call sin, sin, it immediately draws a line in the sand, and we have hate in and out of the church, I can't control any of that. But those who are part of a remnant church, we must pull together. We must not be divided in the church. We must not be divided in this moment. I get it. I get it. I get it. I understand the message of love thy neighbor makes this moment and movement feel like we're causing division because what we are demonstrating, quote unquote, isn't loving. I can tell you that's not in my heart. I'm a loving person and I care for people. I know it's not in your heart. But Jesus isn't coming as a lamb right now. He's coming as the lion of the tribe of Judah. And that makes people feel uncomfortable. Anybody who has a standard that isn't inclusive, that isn't tolerant, you are considered hateful. I guarantee you the next wave of persecution for the church is going to come as labeling us as a hate group. You just better get used to it. They're going to label us as a hate group because they can't put on us anymore, super spreader. So they're moving to the next thing and they're going to call us a hate group. And people who you work with, who don't see eye to eye with you, family members who disagree with you, and when they find out you're associated with a place like this, it's going to come at a cost for you. And we are going to have to pay a price. But understand, the book of Acts, there was 120 in the upper room. There were thousands that followed Jesus before the cross. There were hundreds after the resurrection. But there was only 120 in the upper room, but they were all together. We have to be all together in this, and it may not be the moment or the church for you. The cost may be too high. The sacrifice and the persecution may be too intense, but whoever says, I'm in, we got to do it together. We got to keep fighting. We got to keep speaking out. We got to keep believing. We got to keep pushing in because we are not going to go away. We are not going to back down. We are not coming politically correct, and we are not going to surrender. Last thing here. And they were all together in one place. A place can represent a moment in time. Understand the moment in time that we're in right now. Understand what's at stake, church. My God. Understand the consequences of this moment. First Chronicles chapter 12, the sons of Issachar who understood, had a, who had an understanding of the times and knew what Israel ought to do. God, give us that anointing. Give us that anointing that we, we have never been this direction before. We don't have a strategy. God, give us an anointing to understand the times right now. The place also represents people. They were all together in one place. Radical revolutionaries 
who believe that this is their moment. This is the moment for the church. This is your moment. God is calling people to a place of consecration, sacrifice, courage. Arms wide open. He's saying it, arms wide open. This is our moment. I understand the craziness out there. I get it. But we have to have a consolidation of power in this place to change that place. The change will never happen out there by a political movement until the change happens inside the church. So we position ourselves in this moment, asking God to transform our lives, asking God to restore us, renew us, rebuild us, awaken us, revive us. I love the book of Acts, transform to transform. And I think Acts 4 represents the moment we're in right now. If you know the chapter, Peter and John are being pushed on. And they're pushing back against the political, religious structure of their day. But even in all the hate for these followers of Christ, they could not deny one thing. Come on, get on our feet. Here we go. And this is my heart for, for this church. This is the haters. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, give us a holy boldness, Lord God. I don't want to shrink back, God. I don't want to shrink back. Give me, give your servant all boldness to preach the word. When they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men. Hello, welcome to Greg Farrington's world. They marvel, even though they speak hate. They marvel. Why? Because they realize they have been with Jesus. God, we want to be with Jesus in this place. We want the Spirit of God to be so alive in this place. Presence of God to be in this place. That it transforms this place. A place of power, Lord God, where you pour out your Holy Spirit. A place, Lord God, where we come together. Various backgrounds, but we all come together. You unite our hearts and faith together. And we stand together in this hour because we believe, Lord God, that there is a call. That there is a mission. There is a purpose right now. And God, we will not shrink back. Whatever you put in our hands, Lord God, we will faithfully steward whatever you put in our hands. We will not put our dirty hands over a move of God. Lord God, we'll steward whatever you give this church. Lord God, we'll honor whatever you give this church. And God, if we ask one thing and one thing alone, we want to be with you. We want the presence of God in this moment in a desperate way. Church, if you are at your heart right now, would you just give him your praise and say, God, that's me. That's me, God. Just be quiet for a second. Oh, God. I hear it, and I see it even right now. I see the lion of the tribe of Judah that breaks every chain. I see it in my spirit, and there is going to be a roar. There's going to be a roar from a remnant church that is going to shake the chains of bondage that is over our nation. 
And if you agree with that prophetic word right now, would you give God your best praise right now? I'm trying to live in the word Kathy gave me to not cry. My heart is so broken. Rescue us, rescue your people, Lord God. We will be, Lord God, faithful. Lord God, show up, show up, show up, show up, show up, God. God, rescue us, rescue us, rescue us. We need a Savior, we need a Savior, we need a Savior, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God. The Spirit of God says, the Spirit of God, listen to what the Spirit of God says in this moment. I am not slow, as some consider slow. I am not slow. But he is patient. The Spirit of God says, God is patient right now. I have not poured out my wrath because I want all, I want all to come to salvation in Jesus. This is what the Spirit of God said right now in this moment. So God, take whatever was birthed in the Spirit of God and plant it, Lord God, in these people's hearts, planted it in us as a church. But God, whatever was of Greg Farrington, let it Lord God, we will water whatever's planted with the tears of desire for a move of God. Hear our prayers, Lord God. Hear our prayers. In Jesus' name. Everybody said together, amen. Would you give him one more praise before you leave today?